Well, I think meditation is probably the most important thing that to practice that, and at least most days. And even if you, like I said, if you don't think you're doing it right, still you take that time. It's it's kind of like I'm gonna you commit that time to connecting to spirit, to God, and to your your soul and high self. I've been able to partner with Mind Valley to present you guys free master classes between 60 and 90 minutes covering mind, body, soul, relationships, and conscious entrepreneurship. Taught by spiritual masters, yogis, spiritual thought leaders, and best selling authors. Just head over to nextlevelsoul.com forward slash free. I'd like to welcome to the show, Dr. Lawrence Brock. How are you doing, Dr. Lawrence? I'm good. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about your near-death experience and all the other amazing stuff that you've been doing since your near-death experience. But my first question is, what was your life like prior to your near-death experience? Um, well, I guess I always was kind of looking for something, but I would never have guessed it was a spiritual thing, actually. So I was, um, you know, I went to high school, I went to college, and I was living in Colorado before it happened and working in a restaurant, not really knowing what to do with my life, but um, looking for something. But, you know, I was drinking and smoking pot a lot and doing stuff like that. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I had some... It, in, I had did have some spiritual experiences before that, but I just kind of ignored them. Like, I didn't like even what? Know. Um, well, I guess the biggest thing was I saw my grandfather after he passed away in a movie theater. And it was definitely him because he was a unique looking guy that, um, you know, it's not like I could have seen someone who looked like him. And, um, you know, I saw him, I walked kind of, I was sitting like in the 10th row on the side around, you know, of the movie theater watching a movie. And I saw this person from the back that looked like him. And then I walked around the front and I looked at him and I don't know, I didn't even know what to think, you know, now, if I was had the wherewithal like I do now, I would probably have gone to talk to him. So I just left and, you know, later on when I became more aware and connected, and able to connect to those things, I just realized he had passed away when I was away at school. And he just kind of came back to say goodbye because I wasn't really there, which was kind of cool. That's but again, a, I just dismissed it and didn't think anything of it, which is kind of weird in and of itself. Isn't it interesting, though? I've, I've heard that from a lot of people that things have hap happened to them spiritually throughout their youth and, and things, and they just kind of just like... Uh... <laughs> right but just that i didn't totally freak out was just a you know a sign of my openness towards that kind of thing but not really knowing what to do with it really is that more you think at that point in your life more intellectual meaning that your brain was trying to like no no that's not real but your inner self is going that's why you didn't freak out because if you would have just freaked out you <laughs> which by the way completely acceptable uh, yeah, reaction we, yeah <laughs> It could, you could go into like a horror movie drama in your mind, but uh, no, I, yes, what you're saying is true. I didn't know what to make of it in my mind. It, it didn't really reference anything I knew except for in science fiction. And I just kind of let it go, which again, it's kind of like, why didn't it seem like a bigger thing? But I guess part of me knew that it was okay. And, and I've, as I've talked to a lot of people who've had near death experiences, most of them, I think if not all of them felt a bit lost uh, throughout before, all the before time. They're kind of like walking around, wandering, jumping from thing to thing, not really feeling anything internal, uh, any connection to, to a higher power or even just having – an understanding of what to do while they're walking around the earth. Uh, it sounds like that's what happened to you. Yes. I mean, I, had, I wouldn't say it's, I did 
when I lived in Colorado, I always had a passion for cooking. So I got a job in a restaurant. And so it wasn't nothing, but it, the perce perception is very different. Even while I had my near death experience, it's not like I even knew what to make of that. It wasn't like now, well, there was no internet. It's not like you could look it up and have, I didn't know those words or anything like that. So even that, I had this great experience. I didn't really tell that many people right when it happened either. Didn't know what to make of it at all. And, and what year was it when you had it? 1976. So it's just starting to hit the zeitgeist in books like Raymond Moody. and That that year it was starting to be there, but I, I didn't know of that. Oh, yeah. It, it, for people listening who are younger, it's a different, different world when you had to... I mean, you could just, <laughs> you could, the library, maybe the bookstore. Right, you'd have to go to the library. If, well, I didn't even think there would be something to look, you know. All you, I, what do you, what do you, if you don't know the term near death experience, what do you look up? Like, how do you like died, came back? Is there a section called died and came back? Is there? <laughs> well, actually, so what I found out a little while later, when I got involved with some spiritual people, there were like the Tibetan. Tibetan Book of the Dead. Sure, there are sure. other books written about it, but it didn't. It wasn't even a thing enough where I would think, "Let me go look it up," because I didn't know that. But I did start meeting people. Now, something probably could be the biggest thing that changed in my life is I just started meeting people that were aware of these kind of things. Something that was really, I mean, it's so cool that it happened, and it happened many years ago but not till maybe within the last year and a half did I realize, wow, this was another amazing thing. This woman showed up at my door, knocked on the door without me looking, without me doing anything, and basically said to me, my sister told me some cool things about you. And her sister was one of the few people I mentioned my experience to. And this woman at the door said, I know this person who teaches about things like that. And I needed to know, you know, but I didn't do anything to even initiate this contact. So it was kind of cool that someone just showed up at my door. Yeah. And it's uh, cool and scary, depending on how you look at it. Um, <laughs> it's all it's all relative, I guess, at that point. Uh, but it was it was it the 70s when that happened. So it was a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Even now, if someone knocks on my door, I don't even answer it because I assume it's just an Amazon package or something. Like right. That. Exactly. Like <laughs> It's true. Yeah, back in, no back cell in, phones, no texting, no internet, none of that stuff. It was so funny. I, thought, I saw a comedian say that the other day. Is like in, when I was growing up, someone knocked on the door. Everyone was excited. Like <laughs> under at the door, we had we had a cake always waiting for people just right, in right. case visitors came over. It was a thing. Then in the eighties, you're like someone knocks on the door. Who are you to knock on my door? And Don't now, you have a yeah. life? Like you don't even call. Like. Right. Now it makes me nervous if someone knocks. I go, who is that? Like, what are they doing here? Like, Why do you, you want from me? What's going on? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Doc, tell me about your junior deck experience. What exactly happened? Okay. So, like I said, I was living in Colorado at the time. My, I grew up, spent my childhood in the northeast of the United States in Westchester, New York. Um, my roommate in Colorado was also, you know, a friend from my childhood. So we came back east to see our parents for a little while. We drove in his car. So we had just driven, you know, 2000 miles straight without stopping. And we both went home to rest for a little while. He dropped me off at my parents. And I don't remember how, but we found out about this party one of our friends from high school was having. So we decided to go. I took my mom's little, it was a Bob Ford Bobcat. It was oh, a Bob. God. Yeah, I remember those. <laughs> And but he had a, like a 280ZX, uh, I think it was a Datsun back then. So, but he had a sports car, yeah, yeah. And um, so we went to this party, we were definitely smoking and pot and drinking and some other things. Um, so I was a little high, I didn't feel like I was that high, but I kind of liked the young lady who was having the party, so I pretended I couldn't drive. So I asked my friend to drive me home so I could go back to the party the next day and basically flirt with the girl who was having the party. Almost back to my parents' house, I realized my sister needed to use my mom's car the next day. 
And I said, my friend, drive me back. I got to get the car. And he drove me. I explained that I was pretending or I thought I was pretending I was too high to drive. So I went back to the party. I still remember, I still have an image in my mind of after that, I went in, you know, to tell her I was taking the car. I can still see the party in my mind when I check my memory. And, you know, I look at it now, I should have never been driving because it was kind of extra bright and a little hazy, you know, like when you drink too much. But I remember walking towards the door. The next thing I remember, I was out of my body, looking down on my the car, the Bobcat was smashed and it looked like no one could have survived. Um, my body was leaning against the tree with my legs straight out this way. And a police officer was like crouching over me. Like he was, you know, looking at me. I, I never checked. He is, I assumed he pulled me out of the car. Um, but I was looking down, all of this seemed fine. There was, I was in white light all around me down where my body and the car was. It was nighttime and dark. And um, behind me was this big circle of a different shade of white. And within there, there was like a being, like a sil full body silhouette of a person or being with, you know, still another shade of white light kind of radiating off of that. The feeling was amazing, just like, I don't even, I start to say it, something in me kind of starts to shiver a little bit because I still use that to connect to that incredibly loving, warm energy, like everything was okay. I was okay. The car was okay. My body, even though my head was smashed open, was okay. And life, everything was okay. And um, it, I just seemed to understand things like, you know, in my early 20s, it was, you know, a job, family, all this stuff, you know, I guess still <laughs> those were always concerned, but everything just seemed to make sense. Uh, the being behind me, and I don't know how long ago, but someone finally said, oh, you, so you could see behind you. I didn't even really think of that. It just, I knew what was behind me. It's almost like I could see three dimensionally, but I was looking this way and the being behind me said, you have to go back. Your father wants you to stay. I knew right at that moment, the father was God, not my physical father. And I went back into my body and then came to three days later in the hospital. But so you didn't go through a lot of the, the things that you hear, like a, a life review or no. a conversation. So it was like a really quick, if you say quick near death experience, like you were there. I could, I explain it, but when, like when someone asked me that and I try to check how long it was, I don't really know. It There seemed like it could have been forever or not at all. So the, the thing where people talk about there was no time, that I definitely experienced. Right then also. So was there any information other than that sent to you at that time? Um, I, you know, yes and no. So as I mentioned before, I did not know what to think of this. So it was, and I guess in a certain way, that was a blessing because it became my mission. I need to find out and needed to learn this. And even I would say maybe a year ago, all of a sudden I go, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't understand that mentally because it was, uh, there was something about meditating that I go, ah, oh, I was shown that during my near death experience, I just didn't register it in my mind. So Get, you're asking things that are reference of this physical level and thinking in a linear way, and that did not happen there. So in one way, I got everything, but in another way, I had no idea what to do. As we could say. Right, exactly. All right, so so you so you have your near-death experience. You're, I'm assuming you were like in a coma for those three days or, or out cold? Yes. And when you wake up, um, you have a memory of what happened, correct? Yes. And what's the, have to ask you? What do you, what's going through your head? I mean, you just got done. You're how old are you during this? Twenty two. So you're obviously a sharp, sharp twenty two year old, sharp, very sharp. Yeah. Um, yes. Not knuckleheads at all. Uh, <laughs> offense, no offense to any twenty two year olds listening. Yeah, yeah. no, it's a different way of looking at things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you're you've just had a car accident. You're in the hospital. And then this information, did you think it was a dream 
because again, this is not in the zeitgeist. So nobody yeah. knows about, or it's not publicly talked about so much. So what did you think it was? You know, I just knew that it happened. I didn't really think about it very much. That was the thing. And I, um, you know, I was happy that I was alive. I, you know, remember um, the nurse and the doctor, basic, they didn't tell me I flatlined, but they, you know, the nurse said it was touch and go for a while. The, the neurologist looked at me with this big smirk on his face that I could still remember. He said, you're lucky. And I don't, I don't know, you know, you, you're like, it's, it was just something I kind of put to the side and didn't really think about it or m mention it to people. And I, you know, it's a, a totally different reference now, like now it's on, you know, half the TV shows mention near death experiences or things like that. So you know what to think of it. Um, I didn't, I, I mean, I knew it was a real experience but I didn't know anything more than that. It was just kind of allowing that to happen and knowing something in me really needed to know because I really spent the rest of my life still, I'm trying to find out what it was and what it is because it you just can't seem to know it all right here. So when uh, so how, how long bef after that you woke up, did you start thinking about it more seriously when you started to like, because I'm assuming there's a, a, a reference point of like, I just got to get healthy again. I'm 22. Yeah. I got all that. But at what point did you start going back and going, what the heck was that thing I went through? Like, well, after, so I, I went back to Colorado after getting somewhat physically better. And then my mom kind of convinced me to move back East and I was sitting in my apartment back East. So I, you know, I'm not so good with years and days and all that stuff. So, but within a year, this woman showed up at my door and introduced me to this teacher and right away he started talking about this stuff. So it was some, you know, I talk about, I was connected into the invisible internet, you know, that spiritual internet. And he did not use the term near death experience either, but he had a similar experience. And a, a lot of the people in the little groups that he taught had near death experiences also. Again, not using that word back then, even though it was, it was started to be used. So um, he taught classes and I spent time with him in some in New York City, in Colorado, in Vancouver, Canada, and Texas. I just needed to know, and it was funny because I was born in a Jewish family. Um, he was an Islamic teacher. Again, didn't really matter to me. I just, this truth, this knowing, this loving, what, you know, I'm still always, I don't even want to pin it down too much because it's not a, pinnable down thing. It's this moving, growing, loving, warm, wonderful thing. So interestingly, right away, he started to talk to me about Mary. And as soon as he did, I felt all oh, that and how he would talk like Mary was so open to God's love that she let the Christ energy in. I go, ah, oh, that is what happened to me in my near death experience. Then he talked to me about Jesus. And I go, oh, that being behind me was Jesus. And I just knew that. I know that now. People say, is there any way to prove it? No, of course there's not. But that's my knowing. And he just talked about other things, about you know, he mentioned in the the ocean of divine love and benevolence that he talked about. That was the white light around me. So it started to give me a mental reference and words to use to understand more of what happened and how to explain it. So I have to ask you because, you know, you have at that point in your life, you're, you know, you're in your twenties at that point, you've got a lot of dogma, I'm assuming built up in your mind over the years of religion. You yes. also got in your intellectual mind. When these knowings start coming in, is there a, a little mini battle in your brain going, yeah, I felt all that, but that can't be real. Like Jesus, do I sound like I'm crazy? Jesus was behind me. Like, did you yeah, have yeah. those kind of internal conversations? I did. And to tell you the truth, I still do because <laughs> there are times I'm just in doubt about it. Like, you know, it's it's not like you're a wall. It's not like this solid thing. Um, but it I yes, there and I didn't really, you know, I talked somewhat about these experiences within these small groups and then like now it's everyone's interested in it. So it's a different thing, but it is, 
you know, how do you balance that inside of you? You got to make a living, you know, all that stuff and take care of your house, take care, you know, all those things and still do the spiritual part. It's, it's not an easy task because, I mean, nowadays people are way more open to it, but still what I do and what I see is a little out there, even for most people that are on the path, Yeah, uh, people who are on the path. Yeah. And when you finally kind of came out of the closet, the spiritual closet, if you will, um, yeah. what happened uh, with the people around you, family, friends? Because I always love asking that question because I have yeah. to imagine not everyone accepted the situation and there were some issues. And I just always love to ha- find out how you dealt with it, how you felt with it, how you dealt psycho- psychologically with it. Um, I definitely had some people in my life that, didn't really want to have anything to do with me after I opened up about that. Surprisingly, uh, it's, I mean, some, my dad recently passed away like about a week ago. So oh, it's, I'm so sorry. Thank you. But some nice things with him is when I first told, so I'm a minister. And when I thought it would be such a big deal to tell him this, because after my near death experience, my, you know, I considered myself before that to be Jewish, not that I was that into it, but starting to believe in Jesus is a whole different thing. And when I I wanted to tell my dad I was a minister, and when I told him I was, without missing a beat, he said, do you have to pay income tax? Like, I thought he'd be so upset about that I, you know, was doing something Christian, and um, he was more the typical Jewish businessman concerned about it. Um, Later on in life, he started to become a much more loving man when he was in his early 80s, he met this woman and really fell in love with her and he really changed. So he one time, he must have looked me up online after that. I mean, I talked a little bit about it to him, but he started to talk to me about my near death experience. And in his desire to love and connect with me, which was really nice, he started to say he had a near death experience. But his was he fell asleep while driving one time and the gravel as his car pulled off the road, the gravel hit the bottom and woke him up. So he didn't really have a near death experience how we talk about it, but he said, you know, if the gravel didn't wake me up, he probably would have died. But his wanting to connect with me, you know, soup, and he was not, he was totally sharp in his mind. So it was almost funny to me that, funny in a nice way that his love superseded his mind to you know to try to connect to me about what was going on was that's great. beautiful that's beautiful yeah. so there's a another little aspect to your near-death experience that's very interesting that you came back with some stuff yes um when did you discover the gifts and the abilities that you now had uh when you went after your near-death experience i started to discover them pretty soon um <clears throat> so one thing i noticed and it still happens when i touch people my hands become warm and that i noticed again i didn't know what to make of it it's not like i'm thinking healing you know nowadays it's everywhere on tv i think tv shows really influence people so much to be looking for that i just didn't even think of it but i knew that my hands became warm and people felt good there was one time i prayed for someone and something happened um when I met the teacher I was talking to you about, he started talking to me about it and he would call me a sensitive, which I knew was a good thing because he referred to himself in that way. And he just started talking to me about different healing things. And um, But still, it was hard to really grasp. And I've had my practice for a long time, but I would say about five years ago, something happened that I was really able to embrace it in a way to, you know, be okay with it and not almost feel embarrassed. And like you were saying, oh, what do people think I'm crazy? Um, I just helped this woman who had a a miscarriage who was, she was in really bad shape physically after that. The doctor said, forget ever having a child. And at this point, you know, we're a little concerned about saving your life. And she came to me, one of her friends kind of forced her to come see me. And after two sessions, she sent me this email saying, I don't know what you do, but the doctors say I'm getting better and they can't believe it. And I, it was a couple of years after that, but I was looking for things, you know, it was around Thanksgiving and I started looking for things to post. And I read this, I go, wow, that's like amazing. 
because she went from being very sick to being healthy within a few weeks. And I, know, I just let it in and it was like, I doing something really cool here. And a lot of my embarrassment about talking to people about this kind of out there thing went away right then. So it was gradual over years of accepting it and experiencing and, you know, Almost, sure. it's it sounds like you were almost reluctant about it just kind of like yeah i don't know i mean i can heal people but should i do it and what are people gonna think well i know i should do it part of the reason i talk about it that way is like i said it's not something you can pin down so right. if i describe it a specific way then someone else is looking for that exact thing it is really about helping the person unfold spiritually and usually within there there is a way for them to heal and it could be physically, emotionally. I mean, sometimes I help people with business stuff, with family stuff, you know, all anything it could be. So is that the only gift that you came back with? Uh, you know, sometimes I know things about people that are very, very specific that I couldn't know otherwise. Uh, just comes into your brain, just comes into like images come into your mind? Yeah, sometimes it's images. Sometimes it's images out in the world. Sometimes it is hear, just hearing something. Sometimes it's just knowing. And and when that I'm fascinated by this. When this first happened, how did you? Yeah. How do you deal with this stuff? Like it's kind of like it's kind of like Superman. Like I can fly. Like it's a it weird thing. So how did you handle well, that, it? I mean, my reference is more from Star Trek than Superman. Fair, fair yes, enough. That's, that's what it was like. Um, I, you know, again, it like seeing my grandfather. It just was kind of part of me. So I didn't. It wasn't like I freaked out about it. It is more is it you know should i say something are people going to think i'm crazy kind of thing and um but i it again it just seemed to naturally evolve which is a certain point of view because if you're not thinking that way even when i was young you know i went to hebrew school the things in the bible that were these very mystical magical things are what caught my eye you know the teachings about how you're supposed to act like that bored me to death but like the thing for Hanukkah, there's, you know, there's a story in the Bible where the, you know, one day worth of oil lasted for eight days. And like something in me when I heard that, wow, that's magical. And, you know, things like that. And then, you know, later on, I read the New Testament. So the things Jesus did or, you know, those are the those magical healing things are what really caught my interest from, from when I was very young. Did you like comic books growing up? I did. I really. That like makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. I did too. I mean, I, I you know, I love, I love, I love those superhero aspects. Yeah, and yeah. When I and when I started studying um, the Eastern philosophies, especially the yogic powers, yes. uh, you know, you start reading about those kind of things, and you're just like, this is, it's, it's pretty awesome. I mean, it's. Well, yeah. So a lot of things kept leading me. So when I was. Before my near-death experience, I went, I was taking this class in uh, in SUNY Purchase in uh, New York, and um, that was near where my parents lived, so I was, you know, a bit younger, and um, I, there was this cute girl in the class, and I started talking to her, and she told me she was taking a yoga class, so I went to the yoga class, and some of this, like, wow, this, that girl never showed up at the class, <laughs> I got introduced to yoga and this woman would, you know, she would teach about meditation and stuff like that. So I have a little bit of interest in, you know, introduction to that, but more thought of it like exercise and the breathing part of it. It was all, so there were things along the way. And sometimes I say, if I was really paying attention, I wouldn't have needed to have my near death experience because there were enough clues that I should have been on the spiritual path before that. So, do you, do you meditate? Yes, definitely. So how, what does that do for you? And is it is it a way, is it kind of like a doorway back to that place in your near-death experience, which is I've heard that from others? Yes, definitely. Um, yes. So it, there's the part of quieting inside, which to tell you the truth, even after all these years, doesn't always happen. So I encourage people to meditate, even if they don't think they're doing it right. Um, when it really works, I connect to this energy that comes in and it fills my body and I start to see visions and it is, it is like, or I'm going to say it's like, but it's being there in that place, connecting to the spirit in the way that I did during my near death experience. 
part of you said did any other things so part of what i do when i work with people is i can bring that energy in and i can sort of see a line for them like how they get there some by energy manipulation and some by talking to them they can connect into that which is great so um, let me ask you since you you've been able to tap into this kind of universal energy um, yeah. with your work and through your meditations and things is is there any advice you can give people a who want to connect with their higher selves, with their true selves, with their, their soul, if they're, if you will. Yeah. Well, I think meditation is probably the most important thing that to practice that. And at least most days. And even if you, like I said, if you don't think you're doing it right, still you take that time. It's, it's kind of like, I'm going to, you commit that time to connecting to spirit, to God and to your, your soul and high self. You know, there's different words people use, I think journal writing is the next thing that's really important to do. Um, I think finding someone to help you is really important because those are the times it is outside of what we know. And it is very hard to, in your mind to get outside of what you know. So the, you know, with that teacher and I studied with other teachers, those seem to be the times where I have the biggest jumps where they're, and it's not verbally, there's something that's kind of, trans you know communicated somehow invisibly spiritually to help with that stuff you from your experience do you believe that we are there's spiritual assistance for us throughout our lives do we have yes. you know either spirit guides ascended masters uh, archangels uh, you know by the way um, all of this stuff a year and a half ago Two years ago, I would have said you're nuts. Um, <laughs> by the way, I, mean, I understand because that's I, how I was when I was younger. You know, but. because I I did study you know yoga and you know read a lot of a lot of Eastern philosophies, and I was raised Catholic, and so I have a reference point to a lot of these things. But these these things are a little bit outside the box, like you know the concepts of ascended masters, which are you know like Jesus and Buddha and Yogananda, these kind of people. Um, but then archangels and spirit guides and yeah. council of elders and your life, like your life plan that you come in, all this kind of stuff, you know, I've learned over and it's become much, not only accepted, I understand it as a truth in my life, but I understand people listening to be my like, what? so what is, what, what's your experience in regards to spiritual assistance? I there in my yes, my experiences there definitely is. And you mentioned Yogananda. So I read Autobiography of Yogi when I was in high school. Oh, and wow. it was cool, but it almost seemed like science fiction. And you know, even the way it talked about it, I thought, oh yeah, but that's only for certain kinds of people. Like, right. you know, not in a negative way, in a way that are they're dedicating their whole life to that. And um, so when I wrote my doctoral treatise, I used that book as a reference and it, it just I realized you know, I got that and it was like something out there. And, you know, but then I realized, oh, it's in here. So that was a big, but um, <clears throat> so yes, I think there are things and I, I would say I know there are because I see those things now and I can help people. And um, it's kind of cool when I talk to someone. So I work on the phone and video and it's so cool when people get it in other parts of the world. You know, you talk about whatever, I mean, Jesus is one that helps a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people. So you talk about those things and people feel the difference and they they get visions that are similar or, you know, it, I mean, I've had experiences where there's just no doubt about it. Sometimes people say, how do you know it's not all in their head? I say, it doesn't really matter if someone's getting better. Um, but there are angels around, there's archangels. There, there are the dark things in the spirit also that affect us in a negative way, but thankfully the light wins out over dark, which is a good thing. So it's, it's, Jesus is a busy guy. I mean, I, yeah. I, Jesus, I mean, he needs a break. He needs a vacation. I mean, this poor guy has been working hard for 2000 yeah. years. Well, you're humanizing him, which is I know, I know, I know. It, it is this endless <laughs> loving, caring, healing energy that is like, you know, the the closest thing I can imagine to it is how much I love my daughter. And it's but still see, I say that and I go, I can just let it in 
because you're talking and my mind goes there too. It's like, nope, this is this endless, endless. It's hard for, thing. It's yeah. hard for us to even comprehend like infinity or something that doesn't have a beginning or an end. It's it, it it's hard for our intellectual minds to understand yeah, that. Definitely. But our but our spirit starts to feel it. And that's one thing I I found after speaking to so many near death experiencers is that there is a not only a, a, a telepathy in regards to speaking because there's not language per se um kind of but whatever your language is that you understand at that point uh, yeah. you feel it but there is a knowing and that's as, and if you as you read these ancient texts you start to understand that it, it is a knowing and it's hard for or a truth like a universal truth uh yeah. that is difficult to to articulate in our language it is so i always add that in to what i say to people and then they go oh i know what you mean and it is using words that's kind of guiding them to allow their mind to open up to this thing inside of them and then they open up and it goes and they they get it and then the words don't really matter you know if you're you know all the things we're talking about are connected to certain religions so people have to get past that to get there but they maybe they don't need to once they get that feeling then it's like oh i get it and they kind of know everything well the thing of saying knowing everything is a requirement that there's something to know but so it's more like this amazing acceptance like that everything's just okay so you don't need to know anything, but it's nice to know things. Like it's really cool when I see something about someone and I, you know, it's a very specific thing. That's always kind of fun. It's essentially that kind of feeling you're talking about, the feeling of just knowing that everything's okay is a faith, is a faith that you you feel it and there's no explanation for it. Right. And that's the thing that your intellectual mind is going Man, this <laughs> yeah. no, no. Right. If you try to think about it too much, it you can't get it. So. There's there's those levels of you know the primitive mind, the intellectual mind, and the spiritual, and it's stages that we all have to go through. And at certain points, we're primitive, which is just yeah. instinctual. Then we go into the intellectual. Uh, that's everything's thought, 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 thought. There's a God, but we'll talk about that later, kind of thing. And then the spiritual, which is all feeling, all knowing, all yeah. connection. And understanding that you just, it is what it is, which is so hard for the brain it and the hard. ego and to even deal. even that, it's like, there's a limit there and then it's always more. So it's, yes, it's, it's hard to put into words. But, you know, when we come together and talk about it within a certain agreement, then that energy comes in. And, you know, the thing Jesus said, when there's two or more gathered in my name, there's a great truth to that. In in from from your experience, because I know you know we we live in the West, uh, so we have Western um, you know people like Jesus and Mary and things like that. Yeah. But I have to believe, and I haven't had an opportunity to to um, to talk to a Buddhist or talk to a Hindu going through a near death experience. I wonder if Shiva shows up. I wonder if Buddha yeah. shows up because Buddha is not going to show up for you or me because that's not we know him. But he doesn't yeah. have the same re relevance. Well, like I said, I was born in a Jewish family and Jesus showed up. I, I've never spoken to anyone, but I speak to people who were of different religions all the time. And um, there's so, it, so a lot of my studying spiritual stuff was studying Jalal al-Din Rumi, like for the first 10 years. So the, the Islamic teacher was a Mevlevi sheikh who taught, you know, the the sect that followed the teachings of Jalal al-Din Rumi. So Rumi, the poet, that people read his little poems all the time now. But in his books, he talks about Jesus, Mary, Moses, all of these things. So there is, I mean, in the spirit, there's, there's, no, there's no religion. They're just these amazing beings. But so I sometimes have gone to city yoga they have an ashram in upstate New York, and there are these giant Hindi beings there that are just so cool, you know. Mm -hmm. And but there's also Christian beings there when they're doing, I forget what they call, but they're sitting there chanting and everything. So there are there are beings of all religions that are helping 
you know, I tell people, try not to, in your mind, limit it to either against the religion you were born or for that religion, because it could be pretty much anything. So you mentioned a couple of times your work. Can you kind of yes. just walk us through a session of what you do with people and not as far as the healing, it might be the, I know the physical healing we kind of talked about, but yeah. more the spiritual connection and connecting to the higher power and the universal yeah. energy. How, can you just explain what you do? I can try. I can explain what I do and I know that it works. So it is, um, so I usually say a prayer in the beginning and a lot of it just happens almost automatically now, but there's kind of a connecting into my heart and connecting into the spirit and um, then just kind of holding that energy and luckily having something to say to the person. Sometimes I do have to say, um, I need to stop talking for a moment because I don't even know what to say because his energy comes in. A lot of times my hands will start to shake. They're doing it now because when you said that, I go, I start to try to experience it to explain um, but it is like I see a path for the person that, um, and it's their spiritual unfoldment, but usually along there is he physical healing. Usually along there, there's financial abundance, there's emotional balance and mental balance. And then it's like, um, so I've also studied a lot. And it, so it, in a certain way, the blessing of not knowing what really happened, <laughs> not knowing how to explain it was I got on this mission and I've been studying ever since and I still do. So I know a lot of, about the systems in the body, about acupuncture, about Bach flower remedies, about the emote, all these things. So I can kind of check. And usually now it's just intuitively, it goes to one of those things like, oh, that's what this person needs cleared up. And but I, if I don't, I, there's lists I have in my mind. I could check, oh, is it acupuncture? Is it their nervous system? Is it this? Is it their brain? Is it their emotions? Is, and um, then it is like asking for a healing for them and asking for a blessing and being very open to whether it is Jesus or Buddha or uh, Abraham or the archangels or whatever that is. And allow for that to come in and then just kind of keep holding and holding. And it puts this energy around them. Once in a while, I kind of nudge it a little bit, but I'm always reluctant to do that. Sometimes people are not healing physically. I mean, if it were up to me, people would always get better like that, but that's not how it is. And so sometimes it's like I need a little, to nudge a little bit, which usually turns out all right, but sometimes people, their system will react kind of panicking in relation to that, but it gets their energy going to heal. Now you mentioned something, you mentioned spiritual unfolding. Yes. So are you able to see the evolution of where the spirit needs to go between now and death kind of situation? Or I mean, not like you don't know when they're going to die or anything like that, but you right. see their, not their, their, their kind of blueprint of this life of what they need to do. It could be explained like that. It, to me, it's more like a path. I don't I, actually today I was doing some meditating and it actually was looking like a chain for some reason. And so I'm not resist, you know, I, you want to be open to how, because part of it is how the person's consciousness expresses it and what, you know, their karma is, which is all the past lives, all the things they need to learn and how that can unfold in the most in this lifetime. So it's, Again, you're asking specific questions, but it's just really be open in this loving way of knowing something is really wise and all knowing within them that knows this stuff and how can you connect it to them or how you can get them to be more aware of it because it's very connected. So yeah. it's funny because our conscious mind is kind of the last part to know. There's all these other parts of us that know. It's almost like a cosmic joke. <laughs> you can't know it, but it's right there. It's, so it's always inside of us. And it's that yes. kind of like intuition in many ways, or is that kind of the spiritual yeah, guidance along again, the way? In our intuition, we're trying to put words on it. So it is intuitive, but there's a lot of be careful to label it. So you mentioned spirit guides, and there are spirit guides, but I even tell people be careful with that word because it almost right away you imagine a person. 
and that's making it more humanized and physical. And there's a part that it's like this great, amazing thing. Sometimes there are beings that come in that are very human in form, but it, it's a trick of how do you keep your mind open? It's kind of like, you know, something, then you let go, you know, you let go. And I don't really know how to surf, but I imagine it's like that where you get to a certain, you got to get on this tricky wave and then there's part of it that's easy. Then there's a tricky wave and then there's a part that's easy, but you have to kind of let go. You can't resist the water. You can't resist this thing. And our mind is so quick to go, well, it's this, well, it's this, well, it's this, but you got to keep letting go. But that is, that's just nature. Our nature yeah. is to, we, by, as a survival instinct, we need to put, categories of like you're yeah. good you're bad this is this this is that this is healthy this is not healthy kind of thing so it's hard to break away from that yeah. but yeah when you think of spirit i mean when i think of spirit god i think of you know a dude or a lady yeah, yeah. hanging yeah. out she's like okay he's gotta go this way today let me slap him this way or you know <laughs> the thing. Well, sometimes i look like that but it is right how do you do that where you can open up and so I was talking to someone yesterday and they were kind of choosing into all this karma that had to do with struggling. And they had, and when I'm working with people, I look like, where's the karma? Like, where's a past life that is happier and healthier and better? So then it's like, well, if I can activate that a little bit. So then I said to this person, you have some real, so they had a nice life in Japan where it was really happy. And they just kept, connecting into past lives that were not so happy and, you know, had a lot of negative things. And she goes, Oh, I love that stuff. I go, so spend, I said, spend a half hour every day meditating with that. And that part that's just opening and loving, and you know, then you can bring more of that energy in because that's within your karmic makeup. Like you can't not be in your karmic makeup, but you can kind of choose and you can clear some of the stuff and make it better. So it's essentially uh, a Netflix for the soul uh, where you can actually stream <laughs> yes. a better movie or better show with better experiences and connect to that as opposed to watching the horror movie the entire time. Yes. <laughs> to a that's, certain degree. It's like very technical. It's very technical, have, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> go through things. Well, no, but that's a great way to describe it. It's If we just had a remote control, it'd be a little easier. Uh, obviously. So that's really fascinating. I've never heard that yeah. before, that we have... The, I mean, obviously, our past lives are, are, are the the data, if you will, of our past lives is encoded into our soul's experience. Yes. We are, for for obvious reasons, uh, not exposed to those information because one, we'd lose our mind because we could barely handle what we deal now with. Can yeah. you imagine if you had to deal with like stuff like I was a Mayan, uh, <laughs> I was a samurai, <laughs> I was a samurai. You know, you go back, I was a villager, and and you just like you know go crazy with it, but you're able to tap into those experiences before what, re so it's just more about the energy of that time. So like you just said, use that example, like, oh, you had a really good life in Japan. You can go back to that time and just connect to that good energy to bring it into this lifetime. Yeah. We use our imagination, but the qualities and our attributes are, they're all in us. So when you can focus on those better qualities and attributes, you can make the quality of your life better. There are certain things we need to go through, but there it's usually it's just something we have to go through and the learning is not something we can understand in our mind. So it is, can you go through that and still appreciate yourself and love yourself? That's more of what it is than the lesson. Oh, I need to learn to I know what it is. A lot of times people say, oh, I need to stay away from people like that. Usually that's not the lesson because if you need that kind of person, you'll find someone else. It's more oh, like, yeah. can you love yourself with that person there? Or, you know, mostly about loving yourself. It, but yes, you can choose into the positive qualities from those lifetimes and keep making your life more about that. Then learning how to handle the situations that we might consider you know, not good karma in that same way with the integrity that you did in that lifetime. That was really good. Uh, I have to ask you, did you ever see the, the movie Defending Your Life? Uh, it sounds like I have. Remind Albert, me. Albert Brooks, Meryl Streep. Yes, Street. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Isn't yeah. that a brilliant film? 
<laughs> it is. I mean, he's there just looking the past life pavilion, and they go in, and Meryl Streep's like, you know, yeah, a yeah. knight on shining armor, and he's like a, a terrified that was one villager. Of the early movies about that, yeah, that was great. Yeah, <laughs> such a great, great film. Um, now, just uh, you know, from all of this experience, especially from your near death experience, what was the biggest lesson you pulled away, even at that early stage of of that when you first had it before all the spiritual awakening and understanding, is there a lesson that you just took away from that experience? Um, yeah, I think that love is the answer. You know, love is the question. Like, um, you know, how can I be in my loving more I, that, um, that it's an ongoing process that you never like, you know, you ask questions like, you know, I've been doing this a long time, but I don't consider myself the ultimate expert in any way whatsoever. Even meditating, there's some days it is hard for me to sit there and meditate. Today was one of them. And I said, oh, I need to meditate before the interview. But, you know, I didn't quite make the time. I did a little bit. But um, so it's, you know, it's being the student, being open to learning, knowing that there's more, that it is this endless, loving, wonderful thing. I guess, but, you know, again, it's trying to put something into words that's indescribable. And, um, you know, you just open up to stuff. And so now seeing my grandmother here, I don't know what she has to do with it, but you open up, but love is is the thing. That is the thing. Now I have to ask you, as we've been having this conversation, I'm just curious, do you see anything with me as as we've been Uh, talking, since we're we're having this conversation? I I'm mean, not asking for a free service, sir, but I'm just yeah. asking. <laughs> well, I could, I'm not, I'm not, wasn't, I don't look, I've learned not to do that when I'm not asked. But um, so, yeah, you, I would tell you to breathe into your heart a little bit. And then I could see what, um, you know, there's a bit of a procedure with it. It's not okay. always, sometimes I just see things without people asking, but mm-hmm. it is kind of like, you need a certain permission to do that. So. You have you have permission, sir. How would I do? Do I breathe in? How would you tell me? If yeah, you, you want to do it, if you, you don't can, have to do it, you can put your hand on your in the center of your chest and focus in there and breathe. Um, so there's so there's okay. So yeah, there's some stuff starting to clear for you. So there's it's kind of like your energy field is here that you're aware of. And then, like I said, there is the part beyond that, but then even the part way beyond that is where you start to connect into the spirit and you could do that. And you, you might start to feel something happening because it's starting to happen. Okay. So, and then you just breathe and you kind of let that in. And it's like, what, how can you get your mind to that place? that's just open to, uh, so yeah, there's someone there. I, it might be your grandfather or great grandfather, actually. That's kind of trying to help you. So, um, so y- it's you could do more. So you're kind of clear, which is kind of good because most people are very yucked up, to tell you the truth. And then you could do that and connect. So see, when I'm holding my hand up here, it's helping you to connect to that thing. So, yeah, just take a breath. There you go. So within the things that you've studied in religions, there are all the things from all the religions, but it's like, what do you like the most? Which is the thing that makes you kind of smile inside? So and there's, there's a negative form there that will just ask for that to clear, that's blocking you a little bit. So your energy feels nice and it, expanded. So there is a part of it that we almost like put our, it's more of our imagination up into the spirit. Even it's like our spiritual mind, and then you can start to get information. So when you do that stuff starts to flood in, I'm not seeing exactly what it is, but you're surprisingly clear to tell you the truth, which is cool. (laughs) Well, I've been working out, so there's the yeah. <laughs> physical exercise helps definitely. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. My hand's tingling, that's for sure. Yeah, the hand you did is, good. Yeah, the hand has been tingling. So here, try to like let your mind sit back. Like you see, you're 
you did good. You didn't put your mind out here, but it's right here. It's almost like you let your mind be back here and then see what comes here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Close my eyes. Uh, you can close your eyes. Yes. If that helps you do that. So yeah, really let your mind sit way back because you keep like our tendency, like we talked, your mind keeps going to it to try to define it. Got it. It's like, oh, there's more and it unfolds. And then kind of after the unfolding, you might get the information. You might not get the information now. You might get it in a few days or you might not at all. And there would be a knowing that goes along with it. So you can allow your intention to connect a little further and up into the right because you're being drawn into the spirit really nicely. Luckily, your mind's kind of not going there to interfere with it, which is good. But now you can let your mind go there because you can kind of see some things possible. So, yeah, you're doing good. So do you, you feel the con somewhat of the connection there, right? Mm -hmm. It's really sometimes really light and subtle, but that lightness is what it is. Yeah, so that's good. So breathe into your heart again. You can start to connect back into your body a bit. So the things that are in the very high levels of spirit, it is, it is hard to talk from that place or even know what it is. Okay, so it's kind of cool when you see things on the, the physical, the astral or causal level, because they're very similar to the physical level. But in the spirit, there's not much we can say about it. Well, um, all I can tell you is it started to get to, it's, it's kind of like I started knocking on the door. Yeah. It was like a knock. I started literally kind of like going to another, another place. Yeah. It wasn't visual. It was all feeling. And when I got there, it was, I was just starting to dip my toe in Yeah. and just dipping my toe in. I started to feel an immense amount of strength, power, not physical, just energy, just kind of like, yeah. you saw me do like a, that, that <laughs> thing when I rolled my shoulders back a little bit, I was like, yeah, something's like, I just started, I yeah. felt like I could take on the world. It was this kind well, of Well, that's energy. right. So connecting into that and then we do have to process it somehow. But so, yeah. yeah, if you breathe into your heart and expand your heart and let that in, you know, that's kind of how the healing takes place. That energy comes in and can fix all sorts of things. And it's happy. Uh, it's a happy energy. It's a, it's a loving energy. It usually is. But sometimes it, when there's stuff to clear, it comes up. And But, I'm, but, but apparently I'm pretty clear, as you said. Yeah. Surprisingly clear so that's cool <laughs> <laughs> doc i appreciate that that was really good we did kind of like a live little session of what you do so yeah. uh i'm like a commercial not for you now everybody who's watching all right if you, if you want <laughs> you can talk dr brock yeah i uh, know it's really I, I mean i'll be honest with you it's it's really you know i meditate a lot and everyone on the show okay. knows i'm a very heavy meditator um been meditating for years now and trying to do two to four hours a day sometimes um and those feelings I'm, I'm still a little high by the way i'm still yeah. a little i'm still a little so, high yeah right so now. here this is good so just feel your feet on the ground so you want to be able to kind of do that and then <laughs> have your body there so you can without stopping that you just feel your butt in the chair feel your feet on the ground yeah. and then you start to talk from that place sometimes you might have words sometimes you, you can't but no it's, no it's it's yeah. um as i'm talking my face is like i feel like i'm flush um, it's a weird, this is a weird feeling. Like yeah. I, I, when I meditate, I sometimes get here. Um, yeah. when I do deep, deep meditations, I'll walk out with this blissful feeling, but I've never been able to do it just like that with, I mean, obviously you've helped the situation, yeah. but this is really like, I'm, I'm like really high right now. <laughs> this is, this is the weirdest feeling that I, you know, I've, I've it's kind of That's like a, a touch thing, right? Yeah, it's it so is cool. really weird. I mean, Doc, I got to tell you, this is. I mean, you do good work, sir, because I just, I feel, I feel kind I of just, like, yeah, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just like this energy, and I feel like I could take on the world. I literally feel like I'm 20 yeah. again. I feel like I'm like 18, and I'm like, you feel That's invincible. Like That's kind of the feeling this feeling is. And I'd imagine if there's someone who's sick or has issues, that this yeah. this energy would help. Yes. That 
um, you know, thankfully I apparently am pretty clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been well, working on it, as you can see. I've been trying. I've been, yeah. I've been, I've been spiritually at the gym. <laughs> that's good. Yep, you got to work out just like your body. You got to work out your spiritual stuff too. Um, no, it's it, it, for everyone listening. It is a very interesting feeling. I've never had this. I've had it. I've had taste of this feeling, but it's kind of like a prolonged yeah. feeling of of this kind of love, and it just it's just almost like you've tapped into a, an energy source that you can't explain is the way I'm looking. I can't put words to the way I feel right now. It's bliss doesn't even handle it. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, it's not even blissful. It's I gave up trying to describe it exactly a long time ago, where, you know, but saying I can't quite describe it, that it's kind of like this. Then people go, oh, I know. Because most people experience it at some point in their life doing something, you know, whether yeah. it's like Surfing. I said, with my daughter, sometimes I look at her, it's just like, wow, the greatest thing in the world. There's, you know, sometimes playing sports when I was younger or, you know, whatever, music, whatever it is that you like. I've been in the zone before. Uh, this yeah. is not the zone. This is something, <laughs> this is uh, at another level of the zone. Yeah, I understand, like when you're surfing and you like are blissed out and you're in a different place or you yeah. do, you're writing or you're doing something you love to do. This is a whole other, uh, a whole other energy. Right. It's that, and then you let the spirit in, and then it's like, whoosh, it's really cool. Doc is extremely cool. I, uh, I, man, I'm, I'm, I'm speechless, and I, I am, I. This is what I do for a living, and Doc, I am yeah. speechless now. So I, I, I really do appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions if I can okay. get those yeah. words out. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask you a few questions that I ask all my guests. Okay. What is your definition of a good life? Uh, well, <clears throat> that's a good question. I think having, you know, when you say that, I think of my, I love my daughter so much, you know, when I think about her, that's a big part of it. I mean, having a nice place to live, you know, all those things, but doing the spiritual part, I think is really important. Having other spiritual people in your life, uh, you know, doing, I do a lot of service work. I volunteer a lot. Um, I actually, so I was talking about these positive qualities and attributes, expressing those in whatever way that is for you. Um, I learned a lot, you know, there's certain things that for me, it seems oh, that's natural and how you would do it. There's other ways for other people that to me might not be the way, like there's, like I'm not a martial arts person, but for some people that's the way to express that. And, right. you know, I just not a fighting kind of person, but, you know, cooking, drawing, anything that, you're adding in that spiritual experience into it on top of the bliss we're talking about when you add that spirit in and your qualities are being activated, whatever that is. I love, I'm a cancer, you know, my son. Me, so, me, me, me too, sir. Oh, really? So very nurturing. That is part, I love to cook. I love take care of people. And luckily I found a way to make a living doing that also. So though, but it could be anything. Some people are, even making money could be the way the spirit comes in and their qualities are activated. What is your mission in this life? Um, my mission in this life is to reach God, I guess. And, but part of that is to help people and be a good dad, you know, be of service to my family, to my friends, to my community, to bring in, to be a blessing, you know, to hold that, to be a blessing is not quite it, but it's more like hold that blessing inside and then the overflow of that to be available to other people, I guess you could describe it as. And what is the ultimate purpose of life? Love. That is no doubt. Like everyone's motive for everything is they want to be loved. Even the things that would be so hard to conceive, like how could someone doing something that terrible, but something in them is moving towards wanting love and connecting to spiritual love and love from other people. And where can people find out more about you and the work that your amazing work that you've been doing? Uh, well, my website is lawrencebrock.com. I have my YouTube, Doc, Dr. Lawrence Brock. The kind of cute one is my TikTok because it's Doc Brock at TikTok. So, <laughs> D-O-C-B-R-O-C-K at TikTok. And my phone number for texting or on WhatsApp is 732-567-6388. Doc, uh, I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for this amazing uh, experience. I'm glad you got it. That's so cool. 
yeah, I'm, I'm so glad I I asked that for that experience. And yeah, it, this sure. is this is a beautiful commercial for uh, for what you do because it is it's pretty remarkable. It's pretty remarkable um, what you do. And um, thank you for sharing your story and thank you for the good work you're doing for people you're out welcome. there. So I appreciate you coming on the show, my friend. Thank you.